Hello, hello, hello guys and welcome back to Joe's Ventures and today we're doing part 106 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people are making and use them to talk about some of the wonderful biodiversity that we share our world with. So today, uh, modding for the past like, couple of months or so has been a little bit slow but this has actually been really good because it allows a lot of modders to go back and refine a lot of the older mods they've done uh, either by fixing them or adding them because of new rigs uh, that better fit the animals that they've already made, things like that. So um, even though you could say it's like, oh, not really new mods coming out, I've decided to go with a lot of these because these are really meaningful changes. And um, a couple new ones in there as well, as we'll get into. But yeah, really, really awesome. So we're going to be starting off today with a fish. I know it's been a little while since we had a fish, but this is probably one of the last fish that we'll have for a while. Uh, we have got the Aid. Uh, really, really cool little guy here. So the Aid is uh, it's not that little, but um, these guys are a type of large minnow, and uh, their name in Greek means a white mullet. Uh, really, really interesting fish. Let's see if you dive. Come on, dive for me. Uh, anyway, we'll just keep watching you. Uh, these guys are typically found in brackish or uh, bethnopelagic waters in freshwater, and uh, they are like temperatures of between 4 to 20 degrees Celsius and a depth range of up to about 15 meters or so, which is quite interesting. Uh, let's see if we keep on swimming. Um, also, these guys are found in Europe and Asia, so they're typically found in places such as the Baltic or Northern Caspian and North Sea basins. Also found in the Atlantic Basin, uh, southwards of France. And they're absent in Scandinavia, but they also can be found in Asia. They've been found in the Ariel Basin as well. They've also been introduced to places such as Great Britain and Northern Italy. And have been uh, transported uh, to several countries around the world, such as Europe. And in Europe and in the United States as well, because they're an ornamental fish. People do like them because they're pretty looking. That's kind of what's going on there. Let's see if you'll dive. Yeah, you're really, really cool. It's a really nice uh, model there. Um, in terms of maturity, these guys get about 85 centimeters long uh, on average. Uh, though the common length is about 37 meters, uh, 30 centimeters. And their maximum published weight is about 4 kilograms, and their maximum reported age is about 18 years. And you can see they've got this really interesting padding to them. They've got the reddish kind of uh, fins there, and the more basic padding with a little bit of gold in there, but mainly like silver to yellowish to gold, with a little bit of black down the midside as well. And um, in terms of their biology, these guys typically live in lowland rivers and nutrient-rich lakes. Adults are typically solitary, but juveniles are quite social and gregarious. Uh, they'll undertake migrations to tributaries uh, to spawn in moderate currents on gravel or submerged vegetation. And they feed on various aquatic and terrestrial and animals and plant materials, so they're omnivores, with larger individuals feeding mainly on fish. And the uh, feeding larvae and juveniles thrive on a wide variety of habitats, and then they leave the shores uh, of shoreline habitats, and they leave the shores for deeper waters when they're getting older. Uh, reports have sometimes been seen them hibernize with other species, but they are also not a very tasty fish, but um, people do like them because they're kind of pretty looking. Um, aquarium keeping, you need at least 10 individuals with a minimum uh, aquarium size of over 2 meters, and um, it's not recommended for home aquariums. Uh, these guys, in terms of their mating and uh, breeding behavior, females will only spawn once each season. We'll have a look at you if you'll spawn away. About once each season. And then individual females can spawn with several males. And what will happen as well is that um, males will assemble like a spawning ground and follow ripe uh, females. And then what will happen is that the females will attach the sticky eggs to the gravel of what of, of submerged plant material that they can find, which is pretty interesting. And these guys also um, are at least concerned. So there are species that are still quite common. As I mentioned, they've been introduced to a lot of places, so they're doing all right. And uh, in terms of uh, to humans, they're harmless and they're often kept for game fish and uh, ornamental fish or kept in aquariums or large ponds, uh, which, but that's still quite cool. I really like these guys. Uh, these guys were done by Leaf, Buffsu and Fishing Planet, uh, another old trio that's coming back, but um, these guys are not going to die for us it seems, so we'll just let them swim around and do their thing. But um, yeah, we'll let them swim off. Next up, we've got some cool animals coming up. 
Next up, we've got by Jen Leaf and Fanatic, we have got the Clip Springer. So another really cool little guy. We've got mammals here. We do love our mammals. Oh, let's see. There we are. So let's have a look at here. This is the uh, Clip Springer. So um, they're also known, um, their scientific name is Otragus Otragus or Otragus. Uh, these guys were small antelope found in eastern and southern Africa. And they're the sole member of their genus. They're also quite small. They uh, reach about 43 to 60 centimeters or about 17 to 52 inches at the shoulder. And they weigh between 8 to 18 kilograms or about 18 to 40 pounds. And the coat, as you can see here, is like a red, reddish gray to reddish brown. And it's quite an effective camouflage in their rocky habitat. And um, unlike most other antelopes, these guys have a thick course of hair with hollow bristle hairs. And the horns of uh, males are typically short and spiky, as you can kind of see over here. And uh, typically, oh, this is a male. And are typically only about 7.5 to 9 uh, centimeters in length. So, um, yeah, these, as I mentioned, these guys get about that size. Their head to body length is about 75 to 115 centimeters, or about 30 to 45 inches, with a weight being 8 to 18 kilograms. And they're quite sexually dimorphic, as you can see, the uh, females are typically slightly larger and heavier than the males. And um, the coat, as you can see, reddish brown is uh, good for camouflage. And unlike these guys, they have um, thick hair as, as well as a good adaption for saving the animals during sleep falls and um, things like that. And their course here is really protective. And um, there's lots of variation depending on the different subspecies with the coloration, things like that. But typically, they're all pretty similar. And one thing is that club springers may actually be two or three species, so that's quite interesting. Um, in terms of their ecology and behavior, these guys are typically active at night. So the clip springer will typically rest during the day, uh, the midday and uh, late night. They tend to come out in moonlit periods, things like that. And they will bask in the morning to warm themselves. Uh, they are uh, gregarious animals, so they uh, live in groups. And like other relatives such as dick dicks and orbeez, these guys are monogamous. Uh, so they have a male and female pair. And um, individuals of uh, opposite sex pairs might last until one dies, so that's pretty interesting. The male will tend to stay close within, within five meters of each other, or the mates will. And um, they'll take turns looking out for predators uh, while the other feeds, and the other will look for predators and things like that. So they're quite a good team together. And um, the clip springer will often hop a few meters away if there's in danger. And other social groups, like just small family herds, can get up to about eight members or so, or solitary individuals. And they will greet each other by rubbing each other's cheeks at a social meeting, so that is really cute. I'll have a look at the female again. Males will form these territories that are about seven to uh, seven point five to forty nine hectares, or about eighteen to one hundred twenty one acres. Uh, depends on the uh, rainfall patterns and kind of availability of food. And they will stay in that territory and maintain that territory for their female and their offspring. And males are generally more vigilant than females. And clip springers will also use large dung heaps that are up to a meter tall and up to ten centimeters deep to at the borders of their territories to mark their scent. Mm -hmm. And um, they also have glands uh, that they can rub onto rocks and things to mark their territories. And um, actually, there's a study that reveals that a type of tick uh, detects and um, it comes up to these uh, twigs that are marked by uh, clip springers, so they get a better chance of actually spotting, uh, grabbing one. And the main vocalizations these guys will make are kind of things such as a uh, um, shrill or whistles. Uh, they give out uh, in a clip springer parent to wet which means they're communicating, uh, or it's an anti-predator response. So it's quite common they'll use this against baboons, caracals, many types of eagles, jackals, leopards, hyenas, things like that. And um, there's a few other birds that are, uh, feed on uh, ectoparasites or smaller uh, um, ticks and worms and stuff on their skin. So that includes things like uh, uh, pale-winged starlings and uh, red-winged starlings and familiar chats, things like that. Now, in terms of diet, these guys are primarily browsers, so they'll typically feed on young plants and fruits and flowers. Grass is eaten mainly in the wet season as a minor portion of their diet, though um, some plants may be preferred seasonally, and um, they feed mainly on succulent plants. And they do not do this because uh, they do not really hang around near water bodies, and that meets their water requirements, so they're able to get all the water they need from their food. And they can stand on their high limbs to reach tall branches up to 1.2 meters above the ground. And some individuals have been seen climbing trees up to about 5.4 or 17 feet high. It's pretty cool. In terms of reproduction, these guys are seasonal breeders. Let's see if we can have a little baby here. It's very cute. Are seasonal breeders. Uh, and they will mate occurs, uh, mating occurs generally where they live. So like um, some areas where it's 
uh, warmer faster or where it's uh, cooler they'll time it around that similar to a lot of species uh, females will become sexually mature by the time they're about a year old and males will take a little bit longer mating uh, behavior has not been ob observed but they have a gestation period of about six months which is followed by a single calf that weighs slightly more than a kilogram with births, uh, births peaking from early spring to from spring to some early summer and the births will take place in these dense vegetation and the newborn is carefully hidden for about three months to protect it from predators and the mother will suckle it three to four times a day and their visits gradually uh, lengthen as the offspring grows. Males are quite protective of the offspring, keeping a watch for other mate, males and predators. And after about four or five months, this little baby's weaned and it leaves its mother when it turns about a year old and a clip springer can live for about 15 years. So in terms of its habitat and distribution, uh, the clip spring inhabits like rocky terrain and sparse vegetation in like those areas, and they may migrate to lowlands when they've got some sort of food scarcity. They've been known to occur on the heights of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, and they're also found in high population densities and habitats, uh, favorable habitats over large areas, uh, depending where there's typically rocky with long stretch of grasses and things like that. And um, these antelopes occur in significant numbers across eastern and southern Africa, with their range extending to northeastern Sudan, through Somalia, Ethiopia, down into South Africa. And they also can be found in Angola and the western highlands of the Central African Republic and, the, and also in the Congo and places like that. They are believed to be extinct in Burundi. And um, in terms of their conservation status, these guys are doing okay. They are considered least concern. Uh, mainly, they're, all they are, although they are hunted for their meat and um, leather and hair, they are quite uh, hard to uh, access and unfavorable for hunting. So, and they also do not compete with livestock because they do not uh, really uh, live in those same type of habitats. So they're doing well. They typically just stay out of the way of people and they're fine, which is quite fun. And you can see they've got very interesting hooves there. Um, they also, I believe it's also got a little bit of a, uh, what's the, like a fleshy pad in the bottom of them that helps them climb around, things like that. And I think that's really, really cool. I do love clip springers. Very, very cool little guys. Uh, big, big fan. So um, Leaf, uh, Jen, and Phonetic did a really great job of that. So we're going to be moving on to another one. This one was made by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider. We are going to Australia. We've got the Southern Hairy Nosed Wombat. So look at these round cuties. So the Southern Hairy Nosed Wombat is one of the three living species of wombat. These guys are typically found in scattered areas of semi-arid scrub and melee from the Nuba Plains in New South Wales. And actually the smallest of all three living wombat species. And in terms of description, these guys are quite adapted for digging. You can see they're quite round and adapted with a stocky, robust build. And they're also plantigrade, so they walk on the palms of their hands and feet. And in terms of their size, they range from uh, 77 to 93 centimeters, or about 30 to 36 inches. And they have a body range that uh, comes from 19 to 32 kilograms, or about 42 to 71 pounds. And you can see it's got short hair that is hidden by fur, and it's got this grayish tan in color fur as well. And you can see they've got pointed ears and a robust head that's like a pig. And um, the animal gets its name from the hair that covers its nose, so it's called the hairy nose wombat, and it's also from the south. The teeth also keep growing entirely through the animal's life, which is likely an adaption to its quite harsh diet. And compared to common wombats, these uh, hairy nose wombats have larger temporalis muscles and smaller masseter muscles. And unlike northern hairy nose wombats, these guys have a nasal bone that's longer than the frontal bone. So as I mentioned, these guys are typically found around uh, Australia, uh, Western Australia, Southern Australia, and Southwestern New South Wales. And um, they also live in semi-arid and grasslands or uh, woodlands as well. And in terms of their habitat, look at these cuties, they're getting up and having a go. Um, these guys, along with other wombat species, like perennial grass and sedges, and they, but they will consume introduced pastures and things like that, so they will come up to farmers' lands to do that. Uh, much of these guys, are, um, the diet is kind of found in the complexes where they trim the grasses. The teeth of these wombats are also uh, more effective at grinding foods than things like wombats uh, and things like, um, not wombats, uh, kangaroos. And they typically have a tiny case of colon that's divided into parts that really helps with fermentation, things like that. And they also will uh, conserve water by recycling more urea in its colon rather than releasing it as urine, so they're able to survive on less water, which is quite interesting. And wombats actually release much less than other herbivorous mammals. And they can keep their water content of their poop up to the lowest 40%, so that's quite interesting. And also they have host a uh, really uh, complex microbiome. 
so um, they often will uh, help them uh, get energy and nutrients from their um, poor diet and there's been estimated that these guys account for 60 percent of their day's uh, energy requirements which is quite interesting and the harsh environment uh, which the wombat lives in uh, has uh, further reflected in their energies so the standard metabolic rate is like 130 kilojoules uh, a day which is actually very low compared to uh, most other placental mammals and marsupials and they have also the lowest thyroid uh, hormone levels among uh, mammals and that means they can easily pr produce uh, more than enough energy so it's quite good for them so they basically run in low so that means uh, whatever they eat they're basically getting plenty which is quite cool and like other species of wombats, these guys dig burrows. They dig and live in burrows, which are connected to many different entrances and warrens. That's what they're called. These warrens can be uh, shared by up to 10 individuals, and they'll dig them with their four claws, things like that. And it leaves its new burrow backwards and pushes out soil with its paws when they're digging. These warrens are surrounded by a circle of small burrows that can be 100 to 150 meters away from it. And these... And, um, They'll often, the small burrows along the outer edges are where young wombats go when they are displaced from central warrens. And wombats may actually favour central burrows and not share it with others, so there's no monopolisation or things like that. Wombats actually move between burrows and even warrens sometimes, with male wombats being territorial, it gets wombats from other warrens to defend resources and the warren refuges. And um, trails of uh, droppings connect the burrows, and the males will also mark their territory with uh, anal scent glands and things like that, along with... Um, and fight between males often occur with bites uh, to each other's ears, flanks, or rumps. But typically they're all right in that regard. Let's see if we find another one over there. Yeah, there we, we got a friend. Um, the burrows of these wombats actually can be held at an air temperature about 14 degrees Celsius in the midwinter to 26 of the midsummer, which is the preferred thermonuclear, um, thermoneutral zone for uh, wombats. Mm -hmm. While the ambient temperature outside ranges about 2 degrees to winter up to 36 and above during summer. And these warrens actually make surface conditions and habitats of low humidity and high temperatures better for wombats. So they're able to retreat to their burrow after foraging, and the next night they're able to come out and hang out fine. And in evenings, the wombats will leave their burrows if the amb ambient temperature and burrow temperatures are the same. And early morning, they'll surface when the temperature lower, they retire. So that's quite interesting as well. And in terms of reproduction, as we talk about these cute little babies here, cute little baby man. So, um... In terms of breeding, these guys will breed when their favorite food grows and their peak growth rates, which typically relies on winter rainfall. Typically between August and October, when rainfall is sufficient, uh, they'll get ready to breed. Uh, not every year, though. It depends how much rainfall there is. With uh, breeding and that, obviously males will establish their dominance hierarchies through aggression. And copulation will take place within the warren, with the male remaining in one burrow and the female moving among them. And mating will take place in the underground and involve the males... Uh, doing their thing but the gestation period for these guys is not that long they're about 22 days and most births will occur in october and when the young is born it climbs into the pouch and clings to a teat and it stays in the pouch for about six months for, and gets about 0.45 kilograms with a light pelt and open eyes and then it will soon leave the pouch and start grazing on the surface and the young is fully weaned at about a year old and reaches full size at about three years old and that's when they become sexually mature and um, the microbiology of the wombat patch has actually been like investigated a lot. It suggests that the diversity and composition of microbes actually correlate to the uh, reproductive status of the host. So you can actually tell if they're actually uh, ready to breed by the microbiome in their pouch. So that's quite interesting. And in terms of communication, these guys make a lot of vocalizations uh, and uh, sense for communication. They'll often make rough cupping, uh, coughing noises and things like that but they'll also use smell they release smells and um, use their poop and like scent glands to uh, communicate with each other and while these guys are listed as near threatened there are many subpopulations that are isolated and not viable uh, because it's listed as near threatened it's because of um, mange and things there's a lot of competition with introduced herbivores such as rabbits and uh, cows and camels things like that they're quite susceptible to drought as well, and there have been lots of fragmentation in their range. They've been listed as near-threatened. And um, while they used to be hunted for meat, uh, catching a wombat now is like um, illegal, and typically they're not hunted a lot uh, because they're just quite hard to hunt. And they're often actually considered agricultural pests by landowners because they uh, destroy crops and increase the chances of livestock breaking their legs when they walk into their um, holes. 
and competition between livestock, rubbish and wombats leads to overgrazing and overgrazing and the spread of invasive weeds actually led to the fauna being dominated by annual grass and weed seeds which the wallabies cannot get enough food from and that leads them to starvation and um, because of that competition, things like that, they are considered near threatened but they're still quite a common species that can be found in a lot of places but yeah, Leaf and Nicholas did a great job with this gun, definitely a big fan of you so uh, that's our next one. We're going to move on. We've got next one's done by uh, Leaf, uh, J2Bex, and Narwhaler. We have got the Big Horn Sheep. So really, really cool guys here. Um, Ovis uh, canadensis. These guys are a species of sheep native to North America, but they're known for their very large horns. Uh, in terms of the size, uh, these guys also get these large curved horns. Females have horns, but they're not a little bit smaller, and they can range in all sorts of different colors depending on the type and subspecies and things like that. Let's see, but they got typically grayish or dark brown with that rump, things like that, and a white rump. Uh, typically, males will weigh between 58 to 143 kilograms, or about 128 to 315 pounds, and uh, they weigh are about 90 to 105 centimeters, or 35 to 41 centimeters tall, at the, inches tall at the shoulder and about 1.6 to 1.85 or 63 to 73 inches long from nose to tail. Females are typically a little bit smaller. Uh, they'll be about 34 to 91 or 75 to 201 pounds. Uh, they will be uh, 75 to 90 centimeters or 30 to 35 inches tall and about 1.8 or 1.28 to 1.58 or 50 to 62 inches long. With uh, many of these male bighorn sheep having these large horns that uh, they often use to uh, fight each other and uh, things like that. And actually have several adaptions uh, to protect their brain from these clashes. And they also have pre-orbital glands around their eyes that allow them to uh, secrete um, scents and things like that to basically say, hi, I'm the dominant one. And they use it to communicate as well. And certain subspecies will be bigger than others. Uh, Rocky Mountain bighorns will be quite large and get over 230 kilograms, about 500 pounds. That also depends on the population. Uh, in terms of ecology, these guys will tend to occupy, uh, especially in like the Rocky Mountains and Sierra Nevada Mountains, these guys will occupy cooler mountain regions with desert bighorns living in like, the hot desert ecosystems of the southern US and Mexico, with bighorn sheep generally uh, living in alpine meadows, uh, grassy mountain slopes and foothills, uh, things like that. With, uh, they like places like that, and they like ruggy country, rugged country, and bluffs, things like that. And since they cannot move into deep snow, they prefer dry slopes that are with uh, less rainfall. And um, they usually will spend their winter range in lower elevations, and then uh, go up in the southern in the in the summer. Uh, bighorn sheep are also quite susceptible to a lot of diseases that modern uh, domestic sheep gets, so things like pneumonia as well. And they also um, well, uh, well adapted to the climbing the steep terrain, and they often will seek cover from predators, such as coyotes, bobcats, uh, j jaguars, ocelots, golden eagles, lynxes, and uh, uh, coyotes, things like that. And uh, bighorn sheep of all ages are those threatened by wolves, grizzly bears, black bears, and um, mountain lions. And um, while perhaps best equipped to um, deal with their deal with them because they can jump around, they're typically more agile than their predators. Uh, fire suppression techniques is also useful in these scrublands, which uh, increases cover and predation rates for high mountain lions as well. And they are considered a game species and a desire, so they are hunted a bit. And um, in terms of their social structure and uh, reproduction, uh, these guys will live in large herms, that, but they do not typically follow a ram, uh, unlike the mouflon. They have a strict dominance hierarchy, so prior to the mating season, the rut or the rams will establish a dominance hierarchy to determine the access to use for mating. So what will happen then is that they will uh, clash each other with their horns and things like that. And uh, they'll often uh, exhibit ag agnostic behavior. So two competition, uh, competitors will walk to each other and size each other up before they jump and headbutt each other. And they often can frequently get damaged as well. But um, females, as we look at the females, let's see if we can find a female. Typically, they're a lot more chillaxed. They have a uh, stable, non-linear hierarchy that correlates with age. And females may fight for high social status when they're um, integrated to a harem at about one to two years old. But other than that, they're pretty good. And um, different populations will, or different subspecies will have different strategies. Rocky Mountains, uh, Bullhill Rams, where they have three different courting stages. The most common is actually they will try to follow the ewe. And then tending will often take the... Uh, 
considerable strength and the ewes are typically most restrictive to tending males as they feel that's the most fit. Another tactic of courting, they'll fight for an already tended ewe, so they'll often come like, hey, I'm going to take your girl and then fight. And um, they'll typically, females will typically avoid that, but um, it's another possible way they do. In terms of their little babies, let's have a look at this little baby here because they're very, very cute. In terms of reproduction, they have a six-month gestation, and when temperature and temperature and temperate climates, I mean, the peak of the rut occurs in like November, and one to really two lambs are born in May, and most births occur, occur in the first two weeks of the lambing period, with our pregnant ewes of the Rocky Mountains migrating to alpine areas in the summer to give birth in areas safer from predation, but away from areas with good quality forage. Uh, Lambs typically born early in the season are more likely to survive than lambs born later. In lambs born uh, late may not have access to sufficient milk and their mothers are actually lactating at a time where food quality is lower. And newborn lambs are typically uh, born at about 3.6 to 4.5 kilograms or 8 to 10 pounds and can walk typically like right when they're born. And um, the lambs are weaned when they reach about 4 to 6 months old and then lifespan is about... Uh, 10 to 14 years for uh, you and about 9 to 12 years for a ram. So males live slightly shorter lives on average. But you can potentially get your, obviously, long-lived ones. In terms of conservation, these guys would typically used to be widespread about 200 years ago. They were widespread throughout the United States, Canada, and Northern Mexico. Their population estimated to be between 150,000 and 200,000. Their unregulated hunting, habitat degradation, and disease, and contracted from domestic livestock, have all contributed to the decline. And... Uh, in most areas, they kind of decline just massively. But um, I believe they are considered uh, least concerned, though. So they used to be much more common. They're not. Um, they're depleted is probably the best way to put that. They used to be very, very common, and um, as I mentioned, but they, then they lost all that because of all those factors. But in terms of their conservation, they are doing okay, and they're quite common in culture. People do refer to them a lot and things like that, so... They're not really in any danger of um, going extinct, but they're just not quite to their former glory. But people do hunt them. Uh, people do like ecotourism, seeing the bighorn sheep in their native habitat, things like that. And uh, the desert bighorn sheep is actually the state mammal of Nevada as well. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, really, really cool animals. Uh, Leaf and JJ Bex and their Walla really did a wonderful job with this one. Big, big fan. So uh, next up, we've got another sheep uh, or goat, technically sheep goat, kind of same thing. We have got the uh, Burkhan uh, Mandakor or Makor. I think it's Mandakor, it's Makor. With the big male sleeping. So um, these guys are a large uh, capra or a large species of goats or sheep, things like that. They're typically uh, native to Central Asia and they often be found in the Himalayas, things like that. And uh, typically, Makor will stand at about 65 to 115 centimeters or 26 to 45 inches tall uh, at the shoulder and um, about 132 to 186 centimeters or 52 to 73 inches long and weigh between 32 to 110 kilograms or 17, 71 to 243 pounds. And um, they actually have the highest maximum shoulder length of any uh, species among their genus, though they may be slightly heavier or slightly shorter than Siberian ibex. And you can see here their coat is kind of a light brown with the grays as well, with a bit of sexual dimorphic with males having these large uh, spiral horns and long hairs on the chest, and females being a little bit more drab and even a bit yellowish, as you can kind of see there. Females, as you can see, quite redder, and they have a short beard, and they're maneless, as you can kind of see that here, with shorter horns as well. Uh, both sexes will have these corkscrew horns that they've got here, but the males will grow up to about 160 centimeters, or about 63 inches long, but uh, females have it grow up to about 25 or 10 inches in females, so a little bit smaller. So in terms of the habitat and ecology, uh, mandacores will live in... I'll have a look at you since you're walking around. In terms of their habitat, these guys will live in mountainous terrains from about 600 to 3,600 meters in elevation, where they live in scrub forests, and they'll find like oaks and um, pines and junipers where they like. And they are diurnal, so they're mainly active in early morning to late afternoon with the diet shifting seasonally. So they'll typically graze in the um, spring and summer, and then they'll browse in the winter. And they'll sometimes even rear up on their hind limbs to um, <coughs> get different branches, things like that. And um, the mating season, uh, they'll fight each other, things like that, is during winter. So during the winter, they'll fight each other by locking horns, things like that. 
and the gestation period for these guys is about uh, 135 to 170 days which usually uh, gives birth to one or two kids uh, and occasionally can be three with Marco living in herds, usually up to nine animals consisting of adult females and their young. The adult males are typically solitary. Adult uh, ki uh, females and kids comprise most of the Marco population with adult females making up 32% and their kids making 31%. Adult males comprise like 39% uh, or sub-adults uh, which is up to 2 make up 12% with the youngs being up to 9%. So um, their alarm calls actually uh, commonly uh, resembles the uh, belting of kind of domestic goats and only in the season they can be uh, males and females can be found together in the sides of mountain and during the summer males will remain in the forest while the females will climb to the higher ranges and in spring females stay close to the cliff in areas more coverage to provide protection for their babies and the males will stay in higher elevations for more access to vegetation and to improve their body condition for the breeding season in terms of their uh, breeding uh, or oh, predators these guys get preyed on by wolves uh, black bears or brown bears Golden Eagles, Lynx, and Snow Leopards. Uh, they've been reported to prey on young ones, but they typically have strong eyesight and a strong sense of smell that allow them to detect predators. And because they are quite fleet-footed and able to climb up pretty fast, they're usually pretty able to get away from them. And in terms of their... Uh, this is the particular subspecies we're talking about. This is the B Bukharan uh, Makor. These guys are typically found in Turkmenistan and Tajan, with two or three scattered populations around um, Tazakhshan, uh, which is quite interesting. Almost nothing was known of the subspecies or its distribution in Afghanistan, uh, so we don't really know too much about it, but it's still a really, really cool animal. There's also the close relatives as well, uh, such as the uh, Astor Makor, which is typically found in um, Kashmir as well, uh, in places like that. And the Kabul one is typically found in also Afghanistan and things like that. So there's typically uh, some, there's Falcon Rai and uh, Balak Haran is this one. And they have quite a wide range, mainly in Afghanistan, but they can be found in Pakistan, things like that. Uh, really, really cool. In terms of threats, uh, they're typically hunted for their meat. It's uh, uh, part of the wildlife trade and they've actually been um, poaching is a really bad thing for these guys as well. And they're considered to be one of the most challenging game species, which obviously gives them that name. And um, they've been successfully reintroduced uh, or su uh, successfully introduced into private games in uh, Texas. And um, sadly, though, unlike Aodad, Black Bucks, and the Galleon Axis Dead, they do not escape to, to establish um, grief, uh, range wild population sexes. So I shouldn't say that sadly, but just comparatively, because we don't want wild goats running around in Texas, because Texas is kind of like weird that people like to do that. It is illegal to hunt them in most places where they live, though, especially like India, but um, there's obviously poaching things like that, uh, where they believe their horns sort of have medicinal properties and things like that. But um, they are considered near-threatened. They're a very conservation-dependent species. They rely on ongoing conservation efforts to protect their numbers. But because they have a small population, the 2013 estimates about uh, 5,800 individuals. And they are protected. There are people like regulating them. And um, there's often reserves that, that have been set up to protect their population from like uh, degrad uh, habitat degradation, things like that. So they are doing okay. They are near threatened, but they are a very conservation dependent species. And they probably will be for years to come until um, something major happens like there's an end to poaching or we get more protected areas for them but yeah hopefully these conservation programs will stay in place so these guys will do well and um in culture they're actually the national animal of pakistan and they're one of the 72 animals of the world wildlife fund of nature collect, uh, conservation coin collection as well and they have all sorts of different names uh like the uh kashmiri is actually the one of the subspecies name as well they have all sorts of different names, things like that. So they're very important to the culture of people in Pakistan and India and Afghanistan and things like that. So that's a really, really cool animal. Definitely a big fan. So next up, next one was done by a good boy. This uh, Makawa was actually done by a Narwhala just by himself. Next one was done by a boy and Genora Pizza. We've got the Batrian uh, deer. So it's a really, really cool animal. We're really excited to talk about this one. So this is the Bactrian deer or Cervus halgu um, bacroneris, also known as the Bukhara deer or the Bactrian waipati. These guys are a lowland subspecies of the Central Asian red deer or uh, Cervus hagulu from uh, Central Asia. 
and they're typically uh, actually similar ecology to the uh, Yakar desert uh, deer, and they typically feed in uh, riparian corridors surrounded by deserts as well. And they are separated by others by the Tenshan Mountains and probably and actually potentially a primordial subgroup of red deer. But you can see here these guys typically have an ashy grey coat with a yellowish stain to them and a greyish white rub, uh, rump patch. They also have slightly darker um, uh, marked dorsal stripes and white march into their upper lips as well. And uh, things like that. Fully grown individuals have like five uh, tines to their or five spots to their uh, antlers as well. And it's quite characteristic of most uh, deer subspecies uh, or Central Asian deer subspecies. Uh, in terms of their range, these guys are typically found in Central Cro uh, Croatia, uh, Khorasan, I believe you say that, and they're also found in Ruckish, uh, Russian T Turkmenistan and also Afghanistan and the Tenshan Mountains. But they live in lowland corridors with mixed deciduous forests such as uh, uh, willow and poplar, and um, vegetation surrounded by deserts as well. They typically do not migrate, but they may disperse into adjacent desert areas at night or at times of cooler temperatures. So the population is was greatly depleted. By 1999, there was no more than 400 uh, Bukhara deer remained because they were greatly diminished by uh, conflicts, like uh, military conflicts, uh, though the environmental organizations have taken steps to uh, save the species with the World Wildlife Fund implementing reintroduction programs. Uh, so they've been introduced to a few places around the world. It's also been announced in 2021, they were introduced that the um, the Il Bakash National Reserve in uh, Kazakhstan released 61 of these deer in an effort to revive these species as well. And um, in results of conservation efforts, the population has increased. So in 2006, there's believed to be about a thousand deer. We'll have a look at the babies while we talk about that. There's believed to be about a thousand deer living in Central Asia, with the largest wildlife population found in 2009 being the Kokshiri Nature Reserve with about 320 to 350 deer, uh, with um, next being the uh, Bari Tugi Nature Reserve with 374 animals, and then a few split across a few other reserves. And the latest population update was in 2011, with the population being about 1,430 and increasing. So it's very likely that today there could be around the two to 3,000 mark. So very good conservation success story. But they still don't occupy most of their range anymore. These guys used to live... Uh, pretty much a lot of areas around Central Asia and around like uh, Uzbekistan and um, Kazakhstan and places like that, but um, obviously with uh, military conflicts things like that they uh, Decreased a little bit, but still cool in terms of conservation though. They are, um, are Protected as well They have lots of protections and lots of uh, monitoring and conservation efforts as I mentioned and in terms of predators uh, aside from man Himalayan wolves are probably the most dangerous predator to these guys uh, though they're not really that common enough to really deal with them. Though, though occasionally brown bear have been seen to prey on these deer. And also animals such as dolls, snow leopards, Eurasian lynx and wild boars will prey on calves uh, when when they were together. And also in the past, they were also hunted by the now extinct Caspian tiger, which is actually a um, just a Siberian tiger living in Central Asia. But there are efforts, to, uh, I believe, that people are trying to reintroduce uh, Caspian or um, Siberian tigers into uh, this area to replace the Caspian tiger, which they are basically the same population, that they only became separated 200 years ago by people. So bringing back populations of these guys and a few other species like wild boar and things like that would actually do wonders for the um, uh, reintroduction of the Siberian tiger into these areas. So that's pretty cool. Just thought that out of that little tidbit. But yeah, really, really awesome. Good boy, Ingenora Pizza really did a wonderful job with that mod. And last, and certainly not least, we have got the Indian t uh, Leopard. I was going to say the Indian Tiger, but we've got the Indian Leopard, done by Havok, um, Hachura Ichinos, and Gaboy. And it looks really, really beautiful. Such a big fan of this guy, but it's such a new, cool new look to him. So the Indian Leopard is a subspecies of leopard that's only found in India. And the species itself was listed as vulnerable by the IUCN. And the Indian leopard is actually one of the big cats occurring on the Indian subcontinent. It can be found with uh, lions, tigers, snow leopards, and clouded leopards, which is quite interesting. So in terms of characteristics, they're not too dissimilar from a lot of other um, leopards. Uh, these guys have strong legs and a long tail with a broad muzzle uh, and short ears with yellowish-gray eyes. 
and they typically are spotted and rosetted a uh, pattern except when you get melanistic forms which are dark black and the pattern of the rosettes is usually typical of each individual leopard so you can use them to identify uh, juveniles as we can see here let's see if the little babies here have, have a bit of a woolly coat and appear dark, dark during the uh, to the densely arranged spots and the white tip tail is about 60 or 100 centimeters long in uh, adults and um, the rosettes are larger, typically in Indian leopards and other species, uh, subspecies of leopards. And the fur color tends to actually be more pale or cream in arid habitats or more gray in uh, colder habitats. And a darker golden hue one in uh, rainforests. So that's pretty cool. In terms of their size, uh, male Indian leopards typically grow to about 127 centimeters or about 4 foot 2 inches. And about 142 uh, centimeters to 4.8 inches, uh, 4 feet 8 inches in body size, with a 76 centimeter or 2 foot 6 inch tail uh, to 90 to 91 or 3 foot long tail, and weigh between 50 to 77 kilograms, 110 to 170 pounds. With females being a little bit fuller, smaller, being about 104 or about 3 foot 5 to 117 centimeters, or about 3 foot 10, with a body size of about 76 centimeters or 2 foot 6 inches to 86 foot 87 centimeters or 2 foot 10 inches. And the weight is typically about 25 to 34 kilograms or about 64 to 75. And they are sexually dimorphic, as I mentioned, with males being typically larger and heavier than females. And the largest individual caught was uh, shot in the Dahabol area in um, Hemakal uh, Parish, I hope you said that in 2016. He measured about 8 feet long, or about 260 centimeters from head to tail, and about 86 centimeters or 34 inches at the shoulder, and weighed about 70 kilograms. So they're not the biggest big cats, but they're still a big animal. It could definitely hurt you. <laughs> and uh, in terms of their distribution and habitat, uh, these guys can be found in India, Nepal, Bhutan, and Pakistan with uh, Bangladesh having no viable population, that there are occasional sightings. And they live in all sorts of different habitats. They're quite varied. They live in tropical rainforests, deciduous forests, temperate rainforests, and the northern coniferous forests. And But they do not occur in the mangrove forests of the Sudabans. It is also thought that the Indus River, uh, west of the Himalayas and, and the Himalayas to the north, are actually barriers for the dispersal of the subspecies. And um, in the east, the uh, Ganges Delta and the lower course of the Baramapa River are thought to be natural barriers for the Indo-Chinese leopard subspecies. And um, in Pakistan, they typically will inhabit Himalayan mountains, and they're found in the 1970s. And um, since the turn of the century, these guys have been found in all sorts of national parks and things like that, with the camera, uh, pop camera things and things like that. And um, in terms of their population, we'll have a look at the... Uh, melanistic one as we talk about that you can see the melanistic one quite cool in uh it's believed of, as of 2020 the leopard population is about uh, 1200 uh, to about 1300 individuals so they're doing okay at least and they're typically found in a few other areas across uh, india and stuff like that and similar to other leopard subspecies, these guys are uh, solitary, quite elusive, and largely nocturnal, where they're great at climbing and often will drag their kills up trees. Uh, they're also quite powerful swimmers, though not quite as good a swimmers as tigers. And they're very agile. They can run at over 58 kilometers per hour or 36 miles per hour, leap up to 6 meters or 20 feet horizontally, and jump up to 3 meters or 9.8 feet vertically. They also have a number of vocalizations, include grunts, grunts and roars and things like that. And um, in Nepal's Barada National Park, uh, male leopards have a home range of about 48 kilometers squared, about 19 square miles, or about 17 um, for females, or 17 kilometers squared, or 6.6 .6 square miles for females. Though that changes a lot depending where they are. They're also quite an opportunistic hunter. They will have a very broad diet because they are able to take on large prey with their large jaws and Massive skulls. They often feed on things such as axis deer, sambar deer, nilgai, uh, wild boar, langurs, Indian hares, and peafowl. And even in the Pajar Tiger Reserve, they'll often eat a lot of primates. In terms of reproduction, it's not too dissimilar to other leopards, of course, but we'll go over it. Depending on the region, they will mate all year round. The extra cycle is about uh, 46 days, uh, and the females will usually heat 6 to 7 days. And gestation lasts for about 90 to 105 days until the cub is usually born, when they're usually born in litters of about uh, two to four cubs. Mortality is actually estimated to be about 50% during the first year, and females will give birth in a cave, 
uh, or a hollow thicket or to make a den and the cubs are born with their eyes closed which open about four to nine days after they're born and the fur of the young tends to be longer and thicker than the adults with their pelt being more gray with less defined spots but at about three months of age the young will be able to follow their mother on hunts and when they reach about a year old young leopards can probably feed for themselves but they will remain with their mother about 18 to 24 months the average lifespan of a leopard being between 12 and 17 years so in terms of animals that live with and other carnivores that live with they do live with uh tigers and they are not common in the habitats where uh, tiger density is high though and uh, but they will uh be less common uh or they tend to take smaller prey when tigers are present uh and also tropical areas these guys will um try to avoid each other and stuff like that and even in areas where there's snow leopards these guys are um often both hunt himalayan tar and musk deer and they also may actually get into conflict with sloth bears that can follow them up trees as well but um Typically, there's all sorts of different interactions with different species, and there's lots of overlap, so there is a bit of competition there. India is a very interesting ecosystem, and I think it's quite cool that these guys are doing well there. But, um, yeah, in terms of threats, though, uh, these guys, are the biggest threat to their survival is the illegal uh, wildlife trade, so people hunt them for their skins and bones and things like that. But also some really big threats are loss of habitat through uh, fragmentation and human uh, leopard conflicts for them killing livestock and potentially people, things like that and has driven a lot of issues. There's lots of an illegal trade for these guys for their poached skins and body parts in India, Nepal, and China. Though luckily that is considered typically illegal and uh, they're typically smuggled in. So in India, typically more than 200 leopards are killed by humans each year, which is sucks. And is actually seven times more likely to be killed by Indian tigers, which is, uh, which is kind of sad, even though they're still a little bit more common. Uh, but, um, they're typically doing uh, still doing okay in that regard uh, but in human leopard conflict they're typically because of uh, expansions of agricultural land so um they'll often hunt their livestock and things like that and it'll be found in cities things like that it can be quite dangerous for both villages and their livestock which causes issues and there also are reports of of course man-eating um leopards and a lot of kind of attacks and among the five cat big cats that are less likely to be man eaters, only um, jaguars and snow leopards have at least faced some fearsome reputations. So basically, the big three cats you're most likely to become a man eater are lions, tigers, and leopards. And um, there are ways to minimize conflict by um, helping humans try and uh, uh, basically uh, clearing bushes and things like that to minimize the hiding spaces as well. They leave a light on at night uh, to help be safe and they're typically quite shy. So just these little things will help uh, both humans and leopards coexist. And in terms of conservation, uh, the entire species is considered Appendix 1, but um, the Indian population is considered vulnerable because they're still quite common. But um, in India, uh, Bhutan and Nepal, uh, they're considered common. But in Pakistan, they are considered critically endangered, which sucks. And there are a few leopard rescues around the place, but that's not really going to help when... It's only like putting a band-aid on a broken arm because there are people uh, living with uh, leopards and things like that. Just uh, taking in leopards that are around people and trying to rehabilitate them is good in the short term, but fixing the problem is much better in the end. But luckily, they are considered such a cultural thing. People don't. People do like leopards, and most of the animals I live with, they just want to be able to live with them and not have their children or their livestock get uh, attacked by leopards. So, but they're quite common in culture. Often f featured in uh, Bagheera uh, as Bagheera in the Jungle Book. These books are man eaters, and there's lots of uh, portrayals in Indian and um, in culture about leopards. But they're really, really cool. I'm really, really big fan of these guys. I do love uh, this, and good boy and uh, stuff has done a really wonderful job. We're going to have a look at the cute little babies here. Very, very cute. Then we see this is a melanistic individual. and Really, really awesome. Nice to see some uh, mods. It's nice to see all these mods. A lot of these mods, as I mentioned, barring the um, Aed and the Bactrian uh, camel, these guys are kind of all remasters and remakes to because a lot of new models have come in like the red deer and the new common wombat from the twilight pack so a lot of those have come in and really allowed people to change and uh, update a lot of their mods to make them so much better and i'm really glad they did so yeah well next couple parts we'll definitely have some more remasters but we'll also have a few new species coming as well so um yeah i uh really 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 hope you guys enjoyed this video hope you guys like and subscribe Always forget that little bell icon to get notified about anything. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye.